Hello, this is Mr. Field, and this is my video on covalent structures. Before you go any further, make sure you're confident on atomic structure, electron configuration, and covalent bonding. So check out my videos on those things if you are not. In this video, we are going to learn about simple molecular substances, giant molecular substances, the allotropes of carbon, and polymers. So before we go any further, let's recap um, covalent bonding. So a covalent bond is a shared pair of electrons. Um, and we can draw them like this. So sometimes we draw dot and cross diagrams where we represent that shared pair as a dot and a cross in the overlapping outer shells of, say, that cut hydrogen and that carbon there. If we're drawing a displayed formula like this, then each of these single straight lines represents our covalent bond. So each one of these shared uh, over these lines represents that dot cross shared pair of electrons. We can also have double covalent bonds as well, where we have two pairs of electrons in the overlapping parts of our outer shells and we can represent that like this so that's not an equal sign each of those lines represents or each of those double lines is that double covalent bond now covalent bonding works because the electrons in the um, shared pairs count towards both atoms electron counts so this oxygen for example has eight electrons in its outer shell now because it's got those two shared pairs with the hydrogens so simple molecular substances. These are substances that have a molecular structure. Um, now a molecule is a particle made of a few atoms joined by covalent bonds. There's no clear definition of a few, but generally we're talking between two and about 50 atoms, although some molecules can be much, much larger. You know, DNA contains billions of atoms in each molecule. For example, we might have water. I've got some water here, we'll talk more about that in a second. But ammonia, uh, carbon dioxide, methane, these are all simple molecular substances. And they all have this kind of structure. So in my little um, cube here of nine water molecules, each of these groups of three atoms is one separate molecule. And you can see they're forming their own separate particle. And each of those water molecules, each of those individual particles of water has the same structure of one white uh, so one red and two white atoms, uh, one oxygen and two hydrogens. Now, in terms of their properties, the main most important one is that they have a really low melting and boiling point. Um, normally, uh, they're melting sort of in the range between about minus 270 to about you know 100 or so degrees Celsius. Now, the reason they've got such low melting points is because the molecules are only held next to each other by these weak intermolecular forces. And you can see those here. So these, these little blue kind of springs between each of the molecules here, these are the weak intermolecular forces. Now, because they're weak, they only take a small amount of energy to break them, which means that um, they have a low melting and boiling point. And th this is what happens when you, um, when you melt this water here. Um, we don't break up the individual molecules so it's not it's not like this it's not all the hydrogens and oxygens breaking apart from each other it's not that it is just these weak forces in between them break to give us this situation here the other main property is that these are electrical insulators that means they don't conduct electrical current and the reason why is because they've got no electrons that are free to move so our second type of covalent structure is called a giant covalent structure and this is made of atoms joined by covalent bonds in a repeating 3D pattern. And we can also call this network covalent because it forms this kind of network structure that just repeats on and on and on. So a couple of examples of this. Example number one is diamond. We'll look at this more on the in a couple of slides time. But um, that has this kind of structure. So this isn't showing a single molecule of the diamond. This is supposed to show the idea that this pattern just repeats on and on and on like this. So each of these carbons on the edge is also attached to a whole load of carbons as well. And the pattern just repeats on and on in every uh, direction. Um, another example is silicon dioxide, SiO2. And this contains these beige silicon atoms and these red oxygen atoms in a two to one ratio. Again, in this repeating three dimensional pattern that just goes on and on and on for millions of times in every direction. Now, in terms of their properties, these have very high melting points because to melt them, we've got to break these strong covalent bonds rather than the weak intermolecular forces that we saw on the last slide. And that takes a lot of energy. So they have high melting points. They are also electrical insulators because there are no electrons that are free to carry that current. The 
the allotropes of carbon. What on earth is an allotrope? Well, allotropes are different structural forms of an element. Now, what I mean by that, I don't mean isotopes. So we're not talking the same number of protons, different numbers of neutrons. I'm talking about the 3D arrangement of the actual carbon atoms themselves. So our first one we're going to talk about is diamond. Now, diamond is made of carbon and it has this giant covalent structure where every carbon atom is bonded to four others. And we can see that here. So that carbon is bonded to four others. That one is bonded to four. That one's bonded to four. In fact, they all are. And this pattern just repeats on and on and on. Now, this makes diamond extremely hard. It's the hardest known material. So it's used in all sorts of cutting instruments. So kind of professional drills and other cutting tools that and professionals use are often coated in diamond to make them super hard and good at cutting. We also have graphite. Now, graphite is the most common uh, allotrope of carbon, and it has this giant covalent structure of layers of carbon in a honeycomb arrangement. So we can see there's one layer there and there's one layer there as well. Now, if we look at this, each of our carbons is bonded to three other carbons. That means only three of its four outer shell electrons have been used. And what that means is the remaining electrons are actually delocalized between the layers. Delocalized means that they are free to move. So that means that if I was to put a positive there and a negative over here and apply a potential difference, the electrons can move that direction, which means that um, graphite is an excellent electrical conductor, which is unusual for a giant covalent substance. Um, we also find that there's there are only weak forces between the layers. So those layers slide over each other, which makes graphite a good lubricant it's also why we can use them in pencils because when you pull your pencil across the page the layers slide off and leave a gray mark on the paper okay now we have a few more allotropes of carbon um, the next one is graphene this is a single layer of graphite so we've got the atoms joined um, in this pat honeycomb pattern each of them bonded to three other carbon atoms but it's only a single layer now, again, we've got these delocalized electrons. Um, so that means that this is an excellent conductor and this is extremely strong. Weight for weight, this is just about the strongest material that we've ever discovered. Another one similar to graphene in some ways is carbon nanotubes. Now, carbon nanotubes have a simple molecular structure this time. Um, and you can think of them a, a bit like a small piece of graphene that's been rolled up into a tube. Um, so you can see, if you look closely, we've still got this kind of honeycomb arrangement, but now the whole thing has been looped up into this kind of tube structure there. Again, these are very strong, so we can use these to make very strong and lightweight materials, and they're excellent conductors as well, which means they have a range of different applications, um, things like making various sorts of electrical sensors because they can conduct electricity so well. Um, and our last um, allotrope of carbon is C60, also known as Buckminster fullerene. Now, what this is, this is a simple molecular structure made of balls of exactly 60 carbons arranged like that. OK, they're arranged in the exact same way that the hexagons and pentagons are on uh, on a lot of footballs. Now, although these do have delocalized electrons within each molecule. Overall, these are electrical insulators because those electrons can't jump from one Buckminster fullerene molecule to the other. Um, as of yet, there are no known uses for C60 Buckminster fullerene. So that is our five allotropes of carbon. The final type of covalent structure we're going to look at is polymers. Now, polymers really are just another one of our simple molecular structures, but they're very big ones these times. So these are large molecules made of many smaller ones joined by covalent bonds. And we have lots of examples of these in the natural world. So for example, the starch that you eat in lots of different foods, that's a polymer. So uh, these are these small molecules that starch is made from. These are actually glucose molecules. And they join together to form this much longer chain that we call starch. Um, you will have come across proteins. Proteins are made of individual amino acid molecules um, that again, join together to form this long chain that we call a protein. And lastly, we've got DNA as well. DNA is made of individual units like that and that that we call nucleotides joining together to form the large chain of DNA. And we've also got artificial polymers as well. So all the things that we tend to call plastic, those are different types of artificial polymer. So that's it. That's covalent structures. Well done if you got to the end.